Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast with your host, Andrew Keel. This is the podcast where you can get the education you need to invest 100% passively in the highly profitable niche of mobile home parks. Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. This is your host, Andrew Keel. And today we have mobile home park investor, Jordan Savitsky, principal of 50 West Capital on the show. Before we dive in, I want to ask a real quick favor. Would you mind please taking an extra 30 seconds to head over to wherever you listen to your podcasts and leave this podcast a review? This helps us get more listeners and means the absolute world to me. Thank you for making my day with that review of the show. All right, let's dive in. Jordan Savitsky is the principal of 50 West Capital, and they acquired their first mobile home park in Canton, Ohio, back in 2023. They already have a number of additional mobile home parks in their acquisition pipeline. Jordan, who is based in New York, holds a dual degree in marketing and supply chain management from the University of Maryland. Jordan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here, Andrew. Yeah. Would you mind starting out by telling our listeners a little about your story and how in the world you got into investing in mobile home parks? Yeah, absolutely. I'm really a lifelong entrepreneur and operator. I have been in several businesses, most of which I, I still own, sort of brought in outside management to continue to run. And I've been a passive investor in real estate for probably six, seven years already wow. and invested in quite a bit of, you know, you name it, uh, multifamily, commercial, single family homes, student housing, uh, developments, stuff that's already built, value add projects, but always as an LP. and. I, I've i always kind of been looking for the right opportunity to jump in as really the operator, as a GP. Um, you know, i good at kind of getting my hands dirty um, and uh, really sort of have always enjoyed the real estate space. And so I started looking in probably 2022 or so at, you know, different asset classes within real estate. You know, like I said, I had invested in a lot. And so I sort of saw what the performance over many years of those different asset classes looked like, how uh, COVID, you know, affected each one of them differently. <laughs> they kind of all had their, you know, problems, but diff totally different problems. So as I set out to look for something that I could really sink my teeth into myself, I sort of stumbled upon mobile home parks, I think by listening to a podcast and started to really look at it, learn about it. You know, I. I think initially what I loved about it was that it's not sexy. You know, it's not sort of the typical, you know, I mean, I'm from New York. Uh, most people I know that invest in real estate are investing in, you know, huge projects and buildings in Manhattan and, you know, stuff like that. And mobile home parks would never really come, kind of come onto their radar. And so I, I just kind of liked that from the outset. And then the more I learned, the more I loved. That is so cool. And, and I love it how, probably 90% of the operators that I've interviewed, they all just kind of stumbled upon mobile home parks. It wasn't like, hey, this is what I'm going to do. It's a family business. My dad did this. My grandfather did this. No, it's they all kind of stumbled into it. And and most have had a lot of success. But tell us more about that, like contrarian mindset, right? Like it's not sexy. It's a dirty business. It's affordable housing. It, it requires a lot of hands on attention. You know, how does that correlate to some of the other businesses that you've scratch started? Sure. So, you know, for example, my main business that I started as uh, an emergency medical alert business, like I fall and I can't get up. Everyone's seen those commercials, you know, button, old person wears it. If they fall or have an emergency, they press it, call the monitoring center. When I got into that business, which I did because my family sort of historically been in various healthcare businesses and I uh, worked in private equity and we acquired a company in that industry while I was working there. And so I, I started my own and everyone sort of said, why? You know, like, well, that's not a, that's certainly not a sexy business. Very hard to differentiate yourself. You know, a button is a button, a monitoring center is a monitoring center. You know, what's special about yours? And the answer was really, there are tens of millions of seniors in the U.S. that need this product. And there's a lot of space to, to sell it to them, even if I don't have a differentiated product, so to speak just has to work and you know you have to have good service and that's it and so everyone sort of said all right sounds kind of weird but 
sure. And, you know, here I am six, seven years later, and, you know, we've built a very successful company with thousands and thousands of customers all over the US. And so, you know, I don't necessarily need sexy or, you know, popular or something that everyone's looking at. A lot of times you can kind of find the hidden gems when people instinctively might go, ugh, I don't want to invest in that. Or, nah, I'm writing, there's too many people in that industry. You got nothing special. Uh, a lot of times when people write things off without even, you know, looking through the first page of the book, uh, that's where a lot of opportunity lies. And I found the exact same thing in mobile home park investing. Totally agree. Yeah. No, my experience was the same. The very first investor or a potential investor that I approached, like completely snarled at the idea of investing in, in a trailer park with me. And I tell that story and it's just like, it, it was not sexy. It's not something you, you want to talk about at the country club that you're going to invest in a, in a trailer park, but the returns can be good. And I think there's a win-win where you're going to improve the community for your residents. So let's, let's go into this, Jordan. What has been your toughest hurdle in mobile home park investing thus far? I mean, I know you just bought your first park last year, but yeah, what has been your toughest hurdle with that acquisition? You know, I think the uh, certainly just identifying the opportunity that was right. You know, I mean, everyone kind of talks about analysis paralysis. You know, I've heard it a million times on, um, you know, and all kinds of educational stuff on real estate. But, you know, to a degree, you kind of need a little analysis paralysis because, and especially when it's your first deal and you're going to go out and you're going to raise money and you're going to talk to investors. You got to make sure it's right. You know, you, you can't kind of choose the wrong deal uh, in a bad location or a project that's just too heavy of a lift. Um, you know, you need to pay the right amount of money. And so finding that that opportunity uh, is tough. Um, but, you know, but I was able to do it after a little while. Um, I will say, I think tougher than the first acquisition is actually the second, which people don't really seem to talk about that much, you know, because you're sort of sitting in a position where, okay, I already own a park. I know a lot more than I did before I owned it. That's for sure. Um, but now how do you kind of take this and build a business around it and not just have one park, which is not, you know, it's a business, but it's not really a business. It's like, it's almost like a hobby. Great. It makes money, but it's not a real business. So how do you scale it? And, you know, does that mean, Am I only looking in the general vicinity of the park that I own so that I can build up more management capabilities there and get economies of scale? Do I want to try and find something in a totally different area that, you know, that I like geographically? How's that going to play into the park that I already own? And those are kind of tough decisions combined with, you know, a, a tough buyer's market right now um, yeah, where you know, there isn't really is like a... the toughest, right? You bought in 2023, interest rates are high. You know, maybe tell us about that. Like, how did you how did you make the numbers work on your first deal? Sure. So, you know, I actually everyone talks about interest rates, and you know, it's so bad. Interest rates are so high, and I, to me, this is a this is a great environment to buy in. You know, uh, interest rates go up, they go down. You know, I mean, you look at the last five, ten, twenty, thirty, fifty years of you know interest rate fluctuations. They're all over the place. Um, but the price that you pay for a property, your basis in that property will never change. Okay? If you overpay because the interest rates were 3% uh, when you bought your property, I, the fact that you overpaid, is you're never going to be able to fix that. Maybe you can get lucky, you add value, you can raise the rent. There's a lot you could do. The stars align and you, know, you do well, you make money. But but that price you pay is never going to change. And so I'd much rather pay less and have 7 8% interest rates than, than overpay and wind up in a really bad position when you know it comes time to refinance or a loan comes due. And so I, I think that this is actually a great environment to buy in if you can convince a seller to sell to you at the right take price. Take a nine cap, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, which is very tough to do. How many lots was that first part? First park has 60 lots plus actually 89 self storage units and a single family home. Oh, wow. so a little bit of yeah. everything. Yeah, a little mixed use. And yeah, how do you how do you manage that? What do the utilities look like? So we have a well, we have well water, but we are on public sewer, 
which is great. And we have a full-time manager who's really good. You know, he's like a real manager. He's not uh, like a guy in the park that, you know, gets paid a few hundred bucks or gets free lot rent to just kind of collect the rent. He's, you know, he's a real manager with a real salary who can easily manage three, four, five more parks, you know, in the area if I'm able to, to sort of expand in that geographic range. But yeah, so that's that's how we sort of manage it. And it's well worth uh, well worth additional money that it costs to make sure that you have a, a good manager, especially, you know, I live in New York. There's not a lot of mobile home parks around here. Yeah. And the ones that are around here are in New York, where I would never want to invest. <laughs> and so by nature, I have to invest in places that are pretty far from my house typically a, a multi-hour flight followed by a multi-hour drive. Um, and so making sure that you have the right management structure and systems in place is definitely key to uh, to making sure that you properly operate your park. Totally. Yeah. Operations is so important. And I found it to be tough. You know, I like self-managed my first five parks and it was just so tough. There's so many things to do, right? From, you know, opening the mail to you know, you were taking back in that time, you were taking checks. So, you know, you had 60 tenants mailing you checks every month and just so many different things to, uh, to adapt to. So good management is super important. What's your strategy for, for new parks? Is it buying more around the Canton, Ohio area? Is it value add? Is it stabilized stuff? You know, what, what type of strategy are you embarking on? Sure. Um, so definitely looking, uh, you know, very heavily around, the sort of you know canton cleveland uh ohio area but you know not not really limiting ourselves to that you know ultimately you know i spoke before about how finding the second deal is very challenging because of um you know sort of all these additional factors of do i only buy near my park now or do i go to a whole new market you know i've pretty much decided that i really need to do both you know i don't want to just be a guy who owns 30 parks within, you know, 30 miles of each other. I, I'd like to be sort of more diversified than that. And so we're looking in the Canton area, but we're also looking in other states as well. Nice. Okay. And and how did you like get educated, you know, on the mobile home park asset class and on due diligence and things like that to buy your first park? Because that, you know, I think that's where a lot of people fail is they just get nervous. Like you mentioned earlier, analysis paralysis. You know, what'd you do to kind of make sure you were doing the right steps? Sure. So, you know, luckily there's so much valuable information and educational resources out there, you know, if somebody truly wants to put in the time to to learn the business. I mean, there's so many podcasts, books, there's obviously, you know, the boot camps and the trainings. The first thing I did when I even decided I wanted to think about getting to the business long before I identified the first park I was going to buy was I engaged an attorney. I engaged Ferd, actually, who, you know, many people know in the industry, Ferd Neiman. And, you know, he was an incredible resource helping me through everything from, you know, working with brokers, navigating that kind of playing field to figuring out how to negotiate the deal properly, putting together the actual, you know, PSA and documents. And then uh, yes, getting through due diligence, which, um, you know, it's sort of funny to me that a lot of people seem to get, you know, I've heard, um, you know, a million times, whether it's on your podcast or other podcasts, you know, what was the biggest mistake you made? And most of the time, it comes down to something that happened in due diligence that they missed, they didn't know about, you know, to me, the due diligence isn't rocket science, you just have to make sure that you know, what to look at. And so if you have the right people around you, like you have a FERD that's kind of on your team. He sent us his humongous due diligence checklist. And uh, while very exhausting and time consuming, you know, we went through everything point by point and so far so good. That's awesome. No, FERD's a good guy. He's been on the show and yeah, he, he works with so many new operators to kind of help him do that. So that's really awesome that you, you know, you, you paid the money, right? I think some people try to go cheap and try to just download something online and use that. But yeah, I think that's a good use of your time for sure. Absolutely. Uh, Jordan, what, how did you find that first deal? Was that a listed deal like through a broker or did you find it off market? No, no. I found that deal through a broker. One thing that I tried to 
be very good about from the first deal that I looked at was, you know, I built a CRM for myself and any deal that I look at, you know, that looks even semi potentially interesting, I immediately put into there because, you know, I want to be able to see, you know, a keep track of everything in one place, but also, you know, you get so many emails from brokers um, about deals, you know, that they'll send over and over and over again. And it's kind of hard to keep track of, you know, have I looked at this? Uh, maybe I looked at it and I didn't like it for some reason. I don't want to like go back into it. Uh, and then of course you get a lot of deals that broker gets an offer, they accept it. It's under LOI, they're negotiating the PSA. Maybe it even goes under contract and then falls through happens all the time. Um, and so I want to say at least 50% of the deals that I've analyzed and put some kind of offer out on uh, that was rejected. I hear from the broker again in a month, two months, three months. And this first deal that I took down was that exact, that's exactly what happened. I sort of learned early on that you got to put out a lot of offers. You just really have to put them out uh, because most of them you won't really win, so to speak. Yep. And so when this one was listed, I put out an offer. It wasn't accepted. They went with some, someone else. And then for whatever reason, that fell through. Broker called me, put my offer back on the table and uh, pretty quickly you know, went under LOI and, and got a, a sales agreement negotiated. That's fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. there's Those are some of the best deals. And it's tough to be that call, right? When the deal falls through, to be that backup buyer call. So kudos to you, especially as a first-time buyer, to be in the hunt. You know, for a deal like that, it's tough to get. Uh, it's tough to get on those. What mistakes have you made in mobile home park investing that you know we can learn from? Sure. So, luckily, not that many yet, and hopefully <laughs> ever. The way that I would sort of describe my experience so far is kind of you know aim small, miss small, right? You know, the park that I bought, uh, it's not a small. You know, it's not like a small tiny park that I bought for you know. A, couple hundred thousand dollars. I mean, it was decent size, decent size deal, but, you know, compared to someone who's taken down a $50 million multifamily for their first deal they're ever doing, it's like a limit. And so all the lessons that we're sort of learning are, let's say, let's call them cheap, you know? So for example, we, uh, after closing, you know, we found out that there were a number of tenants who had been prepaying their rent uh, in advance, you know, they'd pay on the fifteenth for the following month, and the seller never told us that. You know, sort of kind of hid it from us. And so, when you know, it kind of came time to collect rent the first day of the first calendar month that we owned the park, uh, there were a bunch of people that kind of said, "Well, we already what are you talking about? We already paid our rent for this month." And you know, we had to go back and figure it out, and you know, it became kind of a whole fight with the seller. But in the end of the day maybe it cost me a couple thousand dollars. And so what, what was the lesson from that? Next time I buy a park, I'm going to take $5,000 and put it into escrow for 30 days after closing to make sure that any little things get cleaned up, you know, but not an expensive lesson, you know, re relatively. Sure. And really just little things like that. You know, luckily the park we bought, the tenants are great. People, you know, really pay on time, by and large, you know, everyone works. It's really a great, community. And so uh, um, stuff can always happen in business. But you know, I, I think that if you do your diligence right, you are confident in what you're buying and why you're buying it, then you know, things should generally work out. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, for sure. Tell us about the storage component. 89 storage units. Do most of the tenants rent those units? Or is it people from outside the park that are renting as well? And have you been successful You know, keeping occupancy up? Sure. Yeah. So there's definitely, I would say, you know, a slight majority of our self storage tenants, maybe 60 or 65% are also tenants of the park, you know, and they look at it as like a great, Extra you know, a great kind of valuable addition to them because for, you know, uh, anywhere from, I think the smallest unit, we charge maybe 20 or 25 bucks a month, you know, the largest is maybe 140, $150. And they love being able to store their stuff right next to their homes. So that's really a big value add for them. And then we actually were also just on a great, we have, we're in a great location. We're on a really main road. 
Uh, we have a big sign. And so we get, I mean, every month we get probably four or five people that just kind of walk in and ask for a unit. I mean, I, I had uh, just last week, somebody online, they booked like five of our largest $150 a month units. Like they just booked it online, walked in, you know, put locks on them, set up auto pay on a credit card. I mean, that's, that's huge. That's, you know, uh, $750 of additional lot rent effectively that someone just kind of off the street came in and, and took one. And so it's uh it's a great value add. It doesn't really cost any money to run um, beyond what I'm already paying to it's managed by the same manager who manages the park. Um, and so uh, it's, yeah, it's great. Good little value add. Yeah. You, if you find an extra spot where you can put some, some self storage units, are these like portable units or are they actually like built in, you know, regular buildings like metal? Buildings? No, these are, these are like actual buildings. These are real. Nice. I mean, it, if there was no park, it would be a self-storage facility, like a business in and of itself. Very yeah. cool. That's awesome. Jordan, if you were looking to invest passively into a mobile home park syndication deal, for example, you know, what are the most important things you would look for to ensure success, you know, knowing what you know today? Sure. So <laughs> I'll sort of give two answers on that or one answer, but I'll sort of, I'll sort of start at the 100,000 foot view and then I'll, I'll zone in a little bit. Because from the 100,000 foot view, my answer would be the same as pretty much every guest that you've ever had on your show. You got to look at the operator. What's their experience? What's their background? How's their success been in mobile home parks or in real estate? But, you know, that doesn't really tell you that much necessarily about somebody. And also, you know, somebody you get your first deal look, like you, you right? Know, like if someone was looking money. to invest with me, ex yeah. exactly. You know, how do you convince someone to invest if the, if the only answer is, well, do they have experience in mobile home parks? And so sure. to me, what's most important to me, and, and, you know, I am a passive investor in many, many real estate deals, is I look at the operator, but not from the, or not solely from the perspective of what have they done in real estate, but just what is their sort of business experience and track record in general? And how will that apply to, the business plan for this park that they're buying for this investment because ultimately like every park unless you're buying something that's totally stabilized which is not the market that i'm in every park is a business plan you're going to infill it you're going to raise the rents you're going to improve it and so what is the sponsor's track record of building a business of What's their business forming a business plan yeah right How and, can and, they and execute? yeah Exactly. What's, what's their track record of executing on it? And can they apply that to mobile home parks? And so that is what is absolutely most important to me. And I think anyone looking to invest passively should, uh, should look for that in someone. And I would also stay away from people who are sponsoring deals as a, as a GP who also have a full-time job, um, mm -hmm. you know, W2 kind of a job that uh, will make it prohibitive for them to uh, get their hands as dirty as they may need to. So, you know, I have businesses, um, you know, this is not the only thing that I do, but ultimately they're my companies. I have managers in place. It's, I don't have a W-2 job. And so if I need to fly to Canton in three hours from now and catch a flight from LaGuardia, I could do it. I don't have a boss who's, you know, I got to request time off and, um, and, and also it is a lot of time, even though I have a full-time manager there, I spend, uh, probably the majority of my time working on this. And so it's, it's a lot of work. Um, it's not mailbox money, um, unless you're a passive investor, which is great. Um, but, you know, make sure that you're investing with an operator that has business acumen, knows how to execute, has a good track record in general, and is is able and willing to put in the time necessary to, uh, you know, to see the investment succeed and not have it as kind of a hobby. That's a great, a great tip right there. Thank you for sharing that because I, I don't think anyone else has discussed that, but I think some of the best deals as an LP that you can get is if you can find a newbie, you know, that's getting into their first couple of deals, they're raising money, their terms are, you know, typically more favorable to LPs. And if you find someone that, that can execute, you know, like my very first investor, you know, he took a chance on me. You know, I had flipped houses previously and and had a, you know, a little track record I could show him. But 
yeah, some sort of project management experience, I think is, is imp- it's a little bit harder to, it's like, it's harder to find. It's harder to get that out of them, right? Like it's, it's less tangible, but I do think that's a good tip on, on finding good operators. So thank you for that. What does the perfect yeah. mobile home park look like in your eyes and why knowing what you know now, Jordan? I don't think there is such a thing. There is no perfect mobile home park. A mobile home park in Ohio, that is a perfect looking investment, may look completely different from a mobile home park in Florida that I would say is the perfect mobile home park investment. You know, there's a lot of factors at play. You know, there's the sort of the ones that everyone talks about, like, you know, the utilities and um, obviously location is important, tenant base. Uh, but, you know, to me, the absolute most important things are going to come down to location, like any other kind of real estate, and then the tenant base. You know, I mean, I, I've gone to a lot of parks to look at, even though I only own one so far. I've, I've looked at many, many of them. And I always make a point to go on like a Tuesday at two o'clock in the afternoon, because you could tell a lot from what's going on in the middle of a weekday in a park about what that park is like and it could be in a fantastic area uh with high rents and it's all city utilities uh, directly build paved roads like sounds unbelievable perfect deal but then you go there on like a tuesday and everyone's just kind of like hanging around um no one seems to be working that's a big red flag to me but you know if i go to a park that's in a secondary market or even a tertiary market um that has lower rents um, and maybe has a well or has a wastewater treatment plant Um, but i go there and it's empty except for some older retired people you know on a tuesday afternoon kind of all else all else equal i would probably consider that park a better investment than uh, than the other one that's on all city utilities and people are all hanging around because i bet that when I get into contract and I'm doing diligence and look at the collections, I'm going to find that the people in the smaller park with a wastewater treatment plant are paying their, you know, they're paying their rent and utilities every month on time. Maybe there's one eviction a year, if even, versus the other park, which is constantly turning over. They got a lot of park-owned homes because they can't find people to sell them to. Um, and so, you know, great city utilities, but that's not the be-all end-all. Uh, there's a lot of factors at play. And so there really is no perfect park. There's a lot of different factors that make a park a good investment versus um, a potentially bad or just worse investment. Yeah, that's great advice. Yeah, I just looked at a, a park that, you know, from the 30,000 foot view, it's like public utilities, direct build. It's like 100 lots, you know, curbs, gutters paved off street parking, all vinyl shingle uh, homes looks beautiful, right? But it's in the middle of nowhere, Kansas. And it, you know, it's like, there's not a big market around there for people. So it's like, not a good deal, even though it looks good and the infrastructure's there. So uh, I agree with you, you got to look at each deal. And I think one of my mentors, he always told me is like, use the 80 20 rule, right? Like, if 80% of it looks good, it's probably a good deal, right? They're all going to have a little hair on it. You're just going to have to live with that. So that's good, good advice. What's the biggest threat to mobile home park investing in your eyes, Jordan? So I actually, I think that the biggest threat or one of the biggest threats um, that I've really come across are poorly intentioned operators and investors. Mm -hmm. And what I'm really referring to are the guys that, they'll come in they'll buy a park they will you know raise the rent immediately won't do anything else to add value to the park and then nine months to a year later they're putting it back on the market and trying to sell it for a couple million dollars more that is the worst thing for this industry because a it makes those deals unaffordable for operators that can actually improve the park because now you know they're trying to charge an amount that is just not viable for a park that needs a lot of infrastructure work. Um, you got a whole load of pissed off tenants because someone came in, jacked up the rent, you know, sometimes by a hundred percent overnight without even, 
you know, doing any kind of facelift to make the residents feel like they're getting any more value. Um, and then also the residents feel like they're just being traded like cattle, you know? Oh, another owner, you know, has come in. I mean, every time I look at a park, I always, the first place I start is I look at Google reviews. I look at the Google reviews of the park. And when you see a park like this, where, you know, the seller just bought it a year ago, guaranteed when you look at Google, you're going to see terrible reviews um, from residents saying, you know, this park keeps changing hands. People keep just raising the rent. The park hasn't gotten any better. I want to try and leave as fast as I can. And, you know, that's not a good park to get into. And frankly, they're ruining those investments for real investors like me and you. They're ruining things for the tenants who now are going to be stuck in a crappy cycle of, you know, it, when somebody does, eventually someone probably will buy them. Maybe they'll get they'll buy it for less than asking, but they will buy it. But they probably won't have the money to put into improving the park anymore. Maybe they will, but maybe it'll take them two or three years. That's really a threat because it also feeds this news cycle of, you know, new owner comes in, buys a mobile home park, jacks up the rent. No one can afford it anymore. I mean, you know, every week, I'm not sure if you get the, um, I think it's Frank, the news, um, yeah, Frank the, Rolf, the right. He sends like, a, yeah. right, the news of the week. And I mean, it's, it's amazing to me how every single week, you know, there's like 20 articles and they're all the same, but they're all different. They're all new, you know, yeah. but the story is the same across all of them, as is <laughs> Frank's analysis generally, because it's the same story. It's just not a good look for the industry. It's going to lead to rent control laws and all kinds of additional bad things. And this all starts with, with those sort of poorly intentioned operators who are looking to make a quick buck, you know, as if they're flipping a single family home. Yeah. But this is not the same asset class as a single family home. This is much more commercial than that. This is like buying multifamily, just typically at a much smaller deal size. And it has to be thought of that way and treated that way, not like, you know, a, a single family home that you can fix, flip and whatever. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, there's there's got to be a, a social aspect of it, a social stewardship side of things. And I think some operators have have pushed the limits a little much on that. Jordan, if any of our listeners would like to get a hold of you, what would be the best way for them to do so? Sure, you can email me. Jordan at 50 westcapitalcom which um, I'm sure Andrew can put in the show notes. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Jordan Savitsky. Google me. I bet my cell phone number is probably all over Google, whether I like it or not. So mm -hmm. give me a call, text me. Uh, always, always happy to talk to people and, and meet other people who are in the space or looking to invest in the space, even if it's just to ask questions about you know, an operator or a potential investment that's not my own. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Jordan. You shared a lot of golden nuggets and uh, we wish you the best of luck. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having. That's it for today, folks. A reminder, please leave this show a review if you got value out of it. And thank you so much for tuning in. Have a good day. Five star review. Five star review. There you go. Thanks, Jordan. <laughs> My pleasure. Would you like to see Mobile Home Park value add projects in progress? If so follow us on Instagram at Passive MHP Investing for photos and awesome videos from our recent mobile home park acquisitions. Once again, that's at Passive MHP Investing on Instagram. See you there.